All right, uh, so uh, it is my great honor to uh, present our panelists here. We have Dr. Dimitri Dimitriadis, who is a principal applied scientist at Amazon. Uh, previously, he worked as a research, as a principal researcher in Microsoft and a researcher in IBM Research in New York and did at and Labs uh, from 2009-2014. Uh, he did uh, his uh, PhD in EC uh, in NTUA in Greece and he's a senior member of IEEE and affiliate member in SLTC. He received his PhD, as I said before, from NTUA and his research interests revolve around the areas of federated learning, speech recognition, speech processing, far-field speech processing, digital signal processing, machine learning, uh, diarization and human-computer interaction. Christos, on the other hand, is a machine learning researcher at Qualcomm AI. He received his PhD from the University of Amsterdam under the supervision of uh, Professor Max Welling. His research interests revolve around the areas of uh, and the intersection of the areas of Bayesian statistics, graphical models, and deep learning, and include but are not limited to uncertainty estimation, compression, fairness, and causality in neural networks. And well, you've met uh, Anna and Marco before, but like for uh, people that are just attending uh, now or, and for the rest of the panelists. Uh, Anna is a, an assistant professor in the systems group of the computer science department in ETH Zurich. Uh, her research interests span across operating systems, computer architecture, and the intersection their intersection with machine learning. Anna's work focuses on computer system design for large-scale applications such as cloud computing services, data analytics, and machine learning. Before joining ETH in uh, August 2020, uh, Anna was a research scientist at Google Brain and completed her PhD in electrical engineering at Stanford University um, uh, with Kozirakis, right? Yes. yes. And then uh, Marco does not really know what the next big thing will be, but he's sure that our next gen computing and networking uh, infrastructure must be viable platform for it. Marco's research spans a number of areas in computer systems, including distributed, large-scale cloud computing, and uh, computer networking, with the emphasis on uh, programmable networks. His current focus is on designing better systems support for AI and ML, and uh, providing practical impl implementations deployable in the real world. Marco is an asso associate professor of computer science in KAUST. He has a PhD from the University of uh, Genoa from uh, in 2009, in 2009, and after spending the last year as a visiting student in the University of Cambridge. He was a postdoctoral researcher at PFL and senior research scientist at Deutsche Telekom, Innovation Labs, and TU Berlin. Before joining KAUST, he was an assistant professor in UC Leuven, and he also held position at Intel, Microsoft, and Google. Guys, you have uh, really big bias. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Stefanos, I'm uh, a research scientist in uh, Samsung AI uh, Center in Cambridge. And uh, I'm focusing on distributed ML and efficient, uh, distributed and efficient ML. All right. Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, I, I I just realized that you cannot see the speakers, but if I just turn on this, probably it's going to be blinding us. Uh, but we'll give it a try. Um, I'll try that. Can you? Let's see. I don't see a sound from the HDMI. Let's see. You could plan in and let me know. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm now connected to the projector. Can you guys uh, say something? Yeah, it's oh, can you hear me? Well, oh, it's still here. Uh, can you guys hear everybody from here? That says long as it goes so the infrastructure has i have done that and i'm still can you guys speak yeah oh it's better now it's the same uh, but it's, it's an old problem with I guess we'll make do with whatever we have. All right, at oh. least right now everybody can uh, see you. I'm unfortunately you cannot see everybody, but I'll send you pictures. <laughs> All right. 
So uh, let's start. So uh, devices right now, they're becoming smarter and they're omnipresent and they're getting more and more powerful. And uh, also uh, it is uh, challenging the, the previous status quo of centralized computation in large data centers. At the same time, new several billion or trillion uh, uh, scale of uh, neural networks are making their appearance. Uh, with uh, the most recent ma manifestation being uh, uh, chat B, uh, chat GPT. And um, uh, yeah, this uh, this creates a new leaf in the history of AI. So uh, let's start with like uh, Anna and Christos. And where do you see the balance between the on-device computation and cloud being shaped in the following years? I don't know if, uh, who wants to speak first. <laughs> Anna can go first. Yeah. Sure. Um... So yes, yeah, so the balance between on-device uh, and cloud. Um, so I think the cloud still plays a, an important role because uh, often the data sets that you're training is very large. And I think training will probably often be happening in the cloud unless for privacy reasons uh, we need to do it uh, on the device. But I think uh, inference is moving more and more onto the device closer to where the application that's running it will actually be consuming the data. And uh, and then things like yeah, also compressing the models and um, quantizing, and, et cetera, making things fit on devices uh, is sort of, I think, how things are, are looking today. Uh, and then maybe sort of looking more into the future, I guess, um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions of how we collect data in the field and uh, do you fine tune on the model as where it's deployed, where you're going to do your, your inference, uh, or do you send things back to the cloud to do your training? And I think that's still kind of an open question. It may depend on the, on the use case. Uh, how often do you need to update and it, do you want to do these updates at the edge and perhaps some... Um, yeah, lightweight training, if possible, way. Um, or and, and how often do you really need to do this in the cloud and redeploy? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess, yeah, that would be an interesting interplay. So Christo, what are your thoughts from the standpoint of like uh, the on-device uh, ML? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think I'm raised with like very, very good points. So I mean, you mentioned ChatGPT. I don't think ChatGPT is something you can sort of train on device so i think like cloud will be will be sort of an important part of uh of fl especially you know for this kind of large models but um you know having said that there are sort of advancements in sort of you know how powerful our chips are uh you know how much we can quantize models how much we can even train with quantization in mind uh so yeah it's a sort of similar um similar vision that probably at some point what will happen is that uh, we'll see that there's like these big models sort of being trained uh, on a data center and then maybe distributed and just, I don't know, the last layer or like some some kind of efficient adaptation happening uh, on device to sort of personalize and capture a little bit like the, the long tail events that, uh, you know, they might not be perfectly captured by just training a centralized model uh, on the cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh... I get what you say, uh, but is there anything in between? And uh, like, can we specialize the use case, for example, for for example, personalization? Uh, Anna mentioned uh, for on-device learning. Is it like uh, is it like that part that should be focused on the on-device things? And like, is there a spectrum, or is it kind of a binary deployment right now? Uh, whoever wants, also feel free to to jump in. So, for example, do you have some devices that are more capable uh, between, uh, let's say, uh, the mobile phone and like the Google cluster that can uh, that can that can yeah. can have a more intermediate role intermediate role in the ML deployment? Yeah, I, I mean, oh, sorry, uh, Dimitri, you were about to say. No, that, that's fine. Uh, I, I I I can win. Please. Like, okay. Okay. Uh, so I mean, uh, the yeah, the, there is a spectrum, and I guess it depends on you know what kind of use case you have and whether uh, that use case can be sort of used both on the phone and both on your self-driving car and uh, both like on like more compute-capable device. And uh, you can always sort of partition your your computation and your models such that you 
try to like conform to the hardware requirements of its uh, of its device and still being able to meaningfully contribute uh, to the overall global model without just you know not doing anything and just sending your data over uh, but I think that is sort of highly uh, use case dependent on whether you can do that or not. For example, if you have, I don't know, like an export prediction uh, task, you, you know, the car might not be able to help you much there. So you're limited to sort of do it either on device or, or on the cloud. Uh, Dimitri, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think I, 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 there is no such thing as a binary decision, meaning everything on the cloud, everything on the device, and so on. Uh, I think the 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 trend that it's uh, it's coming uh, more and more often is we are moving away from the traditional or the vanilla federated learning, for example, or even distributed training, where you have this block that you call model and then you have to send everything on the device or everything on the cloud and uh, you know train or in, infer um, there are examples for example like uh, splitting uh, the model between different uh, nodes or uh, uh, lately some work where you have uh, some kind of collaboration between devices where you fit as much of the model you can on the device uh, where I say as much of the device, not only for inference, but all of all this and for training. So you either have different architectures for different uh, div types of devices, or you can have some kind of asynchronous uh, sub network uh, training or inference and so on. So I, I, I think um, I, 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 when I say federated learning or distributed training, I kind of uh, interchangeably uh, use the terms, but uh, because we can do both. But uh, the paradigm or where we are going right now is let's fit as much as we can from uh, the big model on the device, uh, train or uh, infer with that part, and let the rest uh, happen on the on on the cloud. And uh, that's kind of I think where we are going right now. Uh, and you can see that like uh, with ensembles, you can see that with uh, sub network or asynchronous training and so on. So yeah. Um, Nice. There is no binary thing, yeah. Right. So we saw like uh, several years ago now that uh, well, devices weren't really uh, uh, up to the task, and you had uh, models such as model edge computing or model cloud co cloud computing, sorry, uh, where you were essentially uploading much of the computation uh, to a remote endpoint. This remote endpoint, however, might not be something uh, close. It might be anywhere in between the device, the edge device, and the cloud. Uh, so is there a potential for that role when training in the wild? And Marco, uh, maybe you want to take that one. Uh, sure. So first, I would say I largely agree with you know, all the views you know, shared so far, particularly you know, the one that asserts that the binary is most likely, uh, sorry, is, uh, is the least likely right, for the alternative character. Uh, I was also too small to type, uh, you know, the question in chat GPT. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, you know, tell you what he thinks about it. Um, Maybe whisper, the, whisper could do that. Yeah, we, we we need to start a new app that <laughs> you know, actually do speech to text and then exactly the chat GPT. Um, the yeah, the the only you know new element right is basically this this edge right that participates in the new trends like 5G, um, having inherently more computation that is available at the base stations, um, which can be critical particularly for, for applications that are largely uh, driven by latency requirements that are found, um, whether that is uh, you know, assisting self-driving cars at intersections uh, um, or it has to do with uh, Drones and and whatnot. But anyway, you know, my point is, uh, to the extent that latency becomes you know, an, an important requirement for the application, um, then you may then need to pair it up with uh, um, compute assistance. Um, and so the again, the application may be one for which, um, in terms of feasibility, mm -hmm. uh, this this kind of, of of solutions have to be considered. Um, whether you know we will basically get there before we have trillions of, of parameters or, or before you know the deep neural networks you know get 
sentient. Or, yeah. <laughs> or sentient. Yes, um, that, that is a bit hard, I think, for one sake, particularly because uh, you know, the, the next innovation in ML it, it is always you know one day away. Right? Just have a thousand papers every day um, that are submitted or uh, uploaded out to an archive. You know, maybe something will, will stand down and it becomes the becomes the next the next thing. Um, but, but what I would say, you know, right now it's not clear. Right? But latency as a thing that determines. Okay, we, we understand that. Um, whether you will you will you will basically be there with the constraint on uh, actually memory first or compute first. I, I don't think that that is really clear. Um, if you assume either, right, then uh, then the architecture and the type of devices, however, they they do differ. Um, what I would say the most exciting you know, type of things uh, that are happening more than you know various compression, pruning, uh, quantization, and so forth. You know, in order to make things efficient, um, in my view, also have to do with uh, a lot of fine-grained paradigm that you know now is, is becoming possible. Um, that people have been observing, you know, how you would parallelize across uh, uh, the, the different uh, operations of, of the neural network. Um, thanks also, you know, to, to different designs of, of these uh, neural network models. Uh, so that is uh, uh, something that I believe will, will be reaped even further as an opportunity. And uh, yeah, these are my thoughts. Great. Um, <laughs> so we talked about the spectrum, uh, the spectrum of uh, where compute can lie. Um, the same thing could apply in terms of like having a spectrum in terms of like the privacy. Uh, and we see the privacy being uh, put um, like in a more prominent uh, position in the agenda of many of the stakeholders. Um, do you think that the role of privacy in this setting uh, is uh, should be uh, an innate characteristic characteristic of the algorithm, or like an, a, a design point that can be an afterthought? Uh, anybody can 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 start. Like Dimitri, maybe from the standpoint of uh, speech, and uh, I don't know, Alexia, yeah. you have a lot of advice. <laughs> well, okay, uh, <laughs> I, I I won't speak in, uh, <laughs> about Alexa here, but uh, I I just uh, in, in general I think privacy should be um, a component of the algorithm rather than uh, an afterthought. It's uh, it's much uh, is not easier and more how to say theoretically uh um, correct to to incorporate uh, the privacy aspect or component into the algorithm rather than uh, trying to save the day when uh, you know gdpr uh, kicks in and say oh you cannot do that because this there is a privacy concern uh when you are de when you are designing such uh, such systems or when you are designing uh, the algorithms uh the the privacy and uh, what uh, it's actually leaking to the model uh, should be uh, part of your concern. And um, yeah, that's my uh, metal model, uh, uh, especially for federated learning. Uh, However, as we scale the models, that they, they require more and more data, right? And this data, well, they go not hand in hand with privacy. So uh, when you see such a potential, in such big models, how do you place yourself in the, let's say, trade of line between privacy and utility? Well, it's, it's theoretically right. So, so privacy, like if you have more data, like uh, privacy should be easier to satisfy if you do some kind of some sampling or something like that. So like if you have enough data maybe it's maybe you can also employ privacy but like your utility might not suffer as much just you know to the way of how are like a sort of our the bounds of privacy sort of compose and and the techniques are uh, used so far so i think privacy sort of becomes important in these kind of cases where it is easy to identify we know whether specific individual participated but unfortunately it's also these cases where it can sort of become a bit detrimental and sort of decrease utility yeah, I think also like uh, you might not know, like the policies uh, or laws evolve over time and you also need some flexibility in the design to be able to adopt how you 
um, respond to policies that may arise after you've you know, had your initial design. Uh, and it seems like one thing that's challenging if you've trained your model in a large amount of data and now need to kind of forget what was learned from some subset of the data. Exactly. I don't know of good, I don't know if uh, there's good ways of doing that besides retraining, which is very expensive when the volume of data is large. So but that seems like one challenge for sure. Yeah, I guess unlearning in terms of like tasks, unlearning may might might be one of the big big tasks that uh, will uh, emerge in the in the in the in the immediate future, uh, because the right to be forgotten, like with GDPR, is 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 playing a central role when when deploying something ML based or anything data related. To be honest. Uh, Right, uh, great. Uh, so, um, following up on the privacy, there is federated learning, and uh, there has been a ton of tie, a, a, ton, a, a ton of hype, and uh, well, many papers are being published in the domain. However, real applications either remain limited, uh, with cross device being mainly the uh, mainly driven by big players, mm -hmm. and the cross silo settings taking uh, baby steps. Uh, the, to uh, remind everybody, the cross device setting is something like the Google Keyboard, uh, where you massively deploy something and you learn from its user uh, without but deploying the model locally uh, and aggregating in a privacy preserving way the updates uh, whereas the cross silo setting is mostly focused towards let's say you have uh, a, a small number of entities that cannot directly exchange data but they uh, want to collaborate into training a model uh, that could be for example hospitals um, so um, what do you think is the current bottleneck that is inhibiting key players from um, adopting such solutions? Is it technical? Is it, uh, is it regulations based? Is it uh, just the devices cannot, cannot handle this if we're talking about the cross device uh, setting? Um, what do you think? Oh, if I can. Yeah, of course. The, you know, to, to begin with, I mean, this is, uh, obviously the entire industry mm -hmm. that, um, very large growth and expansion however if you look up on the state of the AI, AI reports and so on AI machine learning skills are still very largely on demand you need to you know have the data scientists the machine learning engineers and so on to even prioritize so usually you know when you look at those surveys you know, there's lots of companies um, that are planning to enter ML, that are hoping to, to, to roll out the strategy and so on, but they haven't really picked up first. And so that means that they've not even figured out in the centralized setting mm -hmm. um, how to really operate um, with these models. There's also a lot of uncertainty um, with regard to the inherent, I would say, um, setting of, of federal learning, which is you don't control the data to begin with, and you, know, you may not know if, if the data is of, of sufficient quality. Um, perhaps there is also consideration with adversarial um, 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 <clears throat> the potential for you know attacks or data that may not really be the one that you want to train on. So um, my point wants to be that you know maybe the federated learning is is putting a bit you know, a step in front um, a bit too much at the mm -hmm. moment um, but it's a very exciting academic topic because if we can figure it out right how to do it then obviously it's far more appealing um, from a point of view of privacy and from a point of view of scalability mm -hmm to push uh, learning towards the edge and to go move forward. Yes, obviously everybody has like, a, well, supercomputer in terms of like what happened several years ago uh, in their pocket. So uh, they can they can use the spur cycles in order to do something. Uh, um, anybody has uh, thoughts on the on the topic? I have no idea, but I wonder. That, 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 oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Super quick I, think, them. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I wonder if users don't care that much about privacy enough to really motivate the companies to invest enough in this. I don't know. Uh, but well, I wonder if there's not enough like user demand for this at the moment. I'm wondering if it's who's leading the discussion in general. 
Is it the companies that uh, that lead? Is it the regulators? Is it the, the users at the end of the day? Uh, Christo, you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, so basically what I wanted to add is that um, like a lot of the things that someone sort of takes for granted when you train centralized are not there in the federate case. So for example, right, so you assume you cannot access the data, so the data are being generated. We are usually interested in like a supervised learning task, right? So who provides the labels? Do you sort of ask the user to provide the labels? How do you do that? You have to create an app that sort of might make it intuitive or you have to rely on some form of weak supervision and there's all of this kind of extra considerations that you need to sort of take into account which sort of makes the transition from centralized to like pure federated training uh you know more challenging um and you know in such cases yeah as anna mentioned right so it might be easier to just uh, instead of trying doing fully differentially private training okay just have a license agreement and have like a click-through uh type of thing and then sort of basically take the data of the of the user and just upload it to the cloud to do the training there because you have more control so it is ultimately about control in the wild. Uh, well, we have already big models and we can start with, a, let's say, a pre-trained model and then uh, obviously personalize to the use case and be exposed to more tailed data distributions that we had had never, uh, had, had never uh, imagined before, right? Because you tap into data sets that, that you, could, you couldn't obviously uh, centralize uh, in, in, in prior years. Um, Dimitri, any standpoints from like the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, f first we, we need to distinguish <clears throat> we need to distinguish between writing a paper about federated learning with uh, CIFAR 10 and with or without labels. And then you, you need to, uh, we need to consider what's the level of investment in terms of uh, the engineering resources and how you deploy the NFL system in the wild and so on. And I, my understanding or my feeling here is that uh, companies or industry in general is kind of pushing back on the, the investment. So they, they don't feel the pressure, let's say, from uh, the legal standpoint to deploy today a federated learning uh, system because they can, let's say, do the, do the training or some part of uh, accessing the data, uh, the, the user's data on the cloud side where they can have a good enough model. Uh, once uh, there is a, a, a generalized or let's say uh, worldwide GDPR uh, in place, then you will see more and more federated learning just because uh, they can get away without doing that. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is um, federated learning is not uh, cheap when you are in terms of engineering resources and in terms of resources in general uh, because you are putting a lot of faith on the hardware at uh, on the device side which uh, usually is uh, the cheapest possible you cannot really have uh, you know a gpu on uh, on the device uh, and run federated learning as you would do that on on uh, on the server side so uh, it's and it's resources uh, hungry, and uh, I my my feeling here, and I'm talking more uh, uh, from as a personal opinion, is uh, the engineering and all these investments required kind of uh, deferred for when you cannot really you know you reach a point when you cannot really get away with it, and uh, and uh, the way of course. There are applications already out there where you really cannot do without uh, federated learning, and uh, you can see this in many in many companies and many applications where uh, federated learning is already out there. Uh, hospitals is also a good, uh, or healthcare in general is a good uh, application because they cannot do without that. Or um, uh, since Gboard was the first one, is uh, people were very <laughs> were very very sensitive about seeing their social security, for example, or their ID number, uh, you know, baked into the language model. So they were more uh, they were pushing, or it was more urgent if you want to actually deploy a federated learning application. So everybody has talked about the urgency to deploy that. Uh, obviously, it's not that 
one day you don't have the urgency and the next day you you you, you come up like with the urgency it's uh, obviously like something that that happens uh, in steps and uh, maybe uh, another bottleneck uh, that exists right now is towards let's say well it's a it's a term that I don't really like, but like democratizing, let's say, federated learning, uh, like because right now it's deployed by really large players in the game. Uh, whereas if we're talking about like uh, the average mobile developer, for example, being able to deploy something in a federated manner, they need to have some kind of ecosystem. Like it could be even the middleware that enables the uh, developer to do that, right? So until uh, there is such an ecosystem that allows to do that, uh, maybe the regulation will stay where it is because it's not physically possible it's not physically it's not realizable let's say but uh, we could state the same thing about cookies several years ago and then gdpr created this urgency for everybody to be more privacy aware um great um so um what about deployments where the data sets are not static so we have imagenet it has remained largely the same from 2012 um well uh all right uh so i'm not sure what you heard but let me uh let not me... much right yeah okay. you, you need to repeat <laughs> the time thing right maybe we need to optimize first uh internet uh, deployment and then we can <laughs> talk about federated learning uh all right so uh what i was saying is that there are data sets and use cases that uh temporarily change so they change over time uh and they develop and you need to cut like the the, the new data distribution uh, you can come up with several use cases about this. Like an example could be like uh, um, um, next word prediction, and like you have several words that come up that meant nothing. Like COVID nineteen meant nothing in two thousand five, <laughs> but uh, but apparently nowadays it, it dominates a lot of discussions. Uh, so do you think that uh, maybe federation is a way to capture this kind of uh, details and uh, and train a model to 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 capture these new trends, or uh, do you have another way? doing that uh, yeah I mean uh, that's that's practically you know one of the main reasons of why you want to do federate learning in the first place right so you have this constant uh, distribution shift if you'd like and I mean you could sort of hypothetically just gather data and just continuously train on the cloud but I, I think like the main point is if this if this uh, distribution shifts are sort of you know slow and, and not very drastic, uh, you can just basically treat them with personalization and there's just some kind of small uh, small updating on the on the overall global model. I think like federate learning is a, is a perfect candidate for solving such kind of uh, problems. Anybody else has? Uh something to say on this uh, on this matter in terms of like the deployment and uh, the use case all right um, then let me ask Christo on the ecosystem side of things and the devices uh, so devices are getting more capable we see every year that we have more and more accelerators uh, being integrated on device uh, they become larger physically they become more capable and they become more energy hungry or even uh, like uh, hot so um towards that direction uh, do you see these well do you see trends in the the in research or in general in technology that drive this development into what we're integrating and for what reason or we're just creating more expensive devices for the sake of it no i i really do think like you know we need like sort of better better compute i mean that's like i mean if if you have if we still had our old uh, nokia phones we wouldn't be able to sort of train <laughs> like in, in a federated manner right so um but you know it, it's not just the just the hardware i think that there needs to be some kind of hardware software uh, co-design uh, and this is practically what is happening now right i think like you know you have the hardware so that sort of becomes sort of better faster um but you also have the software where people keep uh, doing research on you know how you can compress how you can quantize your model and how you can make it run more efficient on device and i think by sort of optimizing simultaneously on these two fronts you know who knows maybe in 20 years from now you could sort of train a mini chat gpt on your phone maybe <laughs> hopefully i would add though that there is uh, you know a kind of like a decoupling between compute and memory uh, 
which is actually much more worrisome, right? Because memory and memory bandwidth is not growing at nearly enough what would be necessary. So compute, correct. Um, primarily thanks to parallelization, right? It, it, it's still scaling decently, but memory is not. Um, so that is actually problematic because the latest advancements in the field are actually telling us that more parameters is rather what you need uh, and not necessarily more compute because you know with this mixture of experts and so on you can start to um, perform uh, um, inference you know on, on uh, using the sparse as the structure of the network you don't need to go through the entire network you just need to find a route within the network and your compute is more or less bound it's not going to grow but memory is actually uh, the problem and so this kind of trend that we have that has been pushing more towards compute is unaligned with the fundamental developments of the This is actually problematic. Yeah, that's that's a great remark. That uh, essentially the bottleneck is in the memo in the in the memory traffic uh, and not scaling the compute. Um, so you talked. You talked very condensely about a lot of topics that I would like to to uh, to discuss about. Let's take the, the dynamic networks. Uh, and uh, Anna, you talked mm -hmm. about uh, essentially data ingestion, but data ingestion had been working on models that remain static uh, mm -hmm. during training. However, imagine that instead of having uh, static models, you had models that are changing based on the data that they are, they are fed uh, with. That essentially puts a feedback loop into the data digestion mm -hmm. loop. Uh, do you have any insights about like how we can train such models in mm -hmm. an efficient manner? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I would say not a lot of insights yet, but this is something that we would like to, to look into. I guess basically instead of tre treating training jobs as one-off things, you treat it as a set of training jobs towards some common goals, towards some application that you have. Uh, and you look at new data as it comes in and you see, um, you know, at what frequency is, at what rate is new data coming in, at uh, what rate maybe is, yeah, do you have distribution shifts or things? And then how do you re-trigger? Uh, I guess there's multiple questions. When do you retrain? Uh, what does retraining even mean? Do you keep uh, some older, you know, your current version of the model and just basically fine tune, or are you uh, retraining from scratch? So there's this balance of not forgetting what you learned before, um, but at the same time incorporating new information. And so I think having system infrastructure to kind of mix old and new data and not keep around necessarily all the data, or at least not treat all the data as equally important, but have some way of distinguishing what data is gonna be um, how can you maybe like summarize a large data set that you've collected over time with a few key examples um, that you can replay so that you don't forget as you uh, train as you on new questions. data? Yeah, I think um, I think these things are important, but uh, exactly what are the right policies for this? I think uh, it's, it's very much still an open question. It will probably depend a lot on the on the use case. Um, but yeah, I think we also need system infrastructure to help us you know, really play around with all these questions and uh, explore it in an efficient manner. Christo, you had uh, an interesting uh, demo on dynamic networks at Neurips. Uh, do you want to talk a bit more about uh, the development yeah. in that uh, field? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that is a very, very important point, especially if you move also to like uh, data structures such as video, right? So uh, the demo, I mean, was about trying to predict like actions from video. And you know that uh, you know you don't necessarily need to process the entire video, so you can just uh, have some way to like dynamically exit uh, after some you know processing some frames because you are sort of certain enough that uh, this action is about uh, know, putting a tile from one place to, to another. Um, and besides that, there is like even I guess besides video, like you could sort of think about a kind of dynamic architectures that sort of process the same input multiple times, right? So you could imagine that um, if you have uh, a very difficult input where you have want to predict whether there's a specific object present, but that object might be occluded by other objects, you might need to use more of your network capacity uh, to actually make the correct prediction. Whereas, uh, you know, if the object is sort of plain inside, maybe, you know, just a, just a couple of layers of the neural network are enough uh, to sort of get uh, get reasonable accuracy. 
Um, so I think like, you know, on average, uh, the computation time does decrease. And, you know, the benefit of this method is that you do not necessarily decrease the flexibility of the model by, you know, pruning it or quantizing its weights to some kind of uh, low bit width. And obviously these, these, these uh, techniques can, uh, they are largely orthogonal to each other, so you can combine them in order yeah. to get uh, additional yeah. benefits. Um, Dimitri, any thoughts on the issue? Of dynamic networks or uh, like their deployment. So uh, I, well, I, I missed the, the demo, so I don't know. But besides that, I, I think the the idea is is uh, it's uh, great. Um, I combine that also with the early exit uh, approach. Uh, this is uh, something that we definitely need to. Uh, yes, because uh, obviously. You have you have uh, the speakers that are being deployed, for example, in a home setting, but you have also your phone that can work across different settings. I mean, in terms of noise. Yeah. So even that noise could uh, could just require more computation, neural computation, in order to to get the output correct. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to the bottlenecks uh, that uh, that Marco said. So we talked about the memory bottleneck when uh, training. Uh, do you see other kind of bottlenecks that are preventing uh, training at scale, either in the data center or in uh, on a device, on a like, portable device? Or well, there's obviously the data bottleneck. I mean, <laughs> people were yeah. referencing, um, you know, the the possibility that also further the learning is not successfully deployed due to the fact that you may need to come up with labels. Um, I mean, if you look at <clears throat> at the state of, of today, right, across vision and, and um, um, text, um, there is essentially three orders of map in the difference in, in, in terms of the data set size. And that's because uh, when you can do self-supervised learning, right, then data is very cheap. Right, you need the transformer, you know, the masking of the inputs and so on. That's a very convenient trick. You can't do it with vision. Um, we haven't really started to, you know, play you know, the ML game against itself. I mean, maybe we'll get there and, you know, the bulk of the data, maybe the most important examples uh, that Anna was referencing were, may actually be completely synthetic, right? Like I can summarize, um, a thousand images into you know one thing that it's just going to be the only thing that you need to go and make a forward backward pass and it's going to give you the boost that you need but you know um getting back get back to the question of you know data as, as a bottleneck largely uh, remains um, it's uh, not homogeneous across the mains but you know it, it is something that is there um, there is also the question about uh, the, the, you know, the communication, right? As we have uh, discussed uh, um, earlier today, um, that one is, you know, still remains. Um, it is something that is largely uh, mitigated through prioritization strategies and uh, ways of combining uh, training. But um, in essence, you know, if you could solve the memory bottleneck, then Obviously, the next modern that you introduced is uh, uh, communication, because by solving the memory bottleneck, uh, I would argue primarily what you want to do is data parallel uh, training, because that is the most straightforward way of parallelizing and probably the most efficient one um, that I could think of uh, today. And so then you're going to have to basically still come to a grasp with the mismatch between uh, moving data, data transfers uh, within a machine with multiple GPUs uh, across your network fabric, and, and potentially, you know, in the large, uh, in the wide area network uh, across the devices, which is, you know, what in the first place also has created the need for a completely uh, a host, I would say, of, of different type of training algorithm for creative learning that do not match the typical model of distributed SGD. Mm -hmm. Um, so we talked about the energy is obviously another factor, which is which goes hand in hand, I would say, with the memory factor. 
then we have thermals, I would say. Uh, because, well, actually, we, we, we're seeing GPUs nowadays melting just because of the TDP that, uh, that they have. Um, and then we have the communication part. Taking the communication part. Um, OK, one big change, for example, uh, was uh, the video streaming application. Then the next big thing in terms of like the, uh, for an ISP, for example, it was uh, uh, online collaboration, like virtual presence. Everybody experienced COVID and everybody like was attending uh, such a video conference. And we're also having issues today with, <laughs> with uh, the bandwidth. Uh, do you think that, for example, the, 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 the collaborative distributed or federated uh, training would have a, a measurable impact on the I, on an ISP's traffic across different use cases, across different scenarios, across different uh, even A/B testing deployments or hyperparameter searches or whatever that might be. Like, is that footprint going to be visible to the ISP so that they can they, that they need to provision additional hardware or different algorithms to tackle to tackle the problem in, at hand? Tough question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess. I, yeah, I, I guess I forgot my sphere at home, so <laughs> uh, it's a bit hard to read that. I mean, certainly models are large, right? So in proportion to that, the, the traffic is going to be that one. Right? Compression and you know, sending data um, changes um, make quite a a good trick right, for, for actually cutting back on, on communication. Um, however, you know, as we know, that affects also the statistical efficiency of learning. The more you could actually exchange the data, um, the faster you could be uh, train you. The <clears throat> my my sense is that there may be really an opportunity for, for edge computing to provide assistance uh, for this kind of applications on the basis of the fact that it's not vital that every single device has a direct line of communication mm -hmm. with the cloud. So something um, hierarchical. Yeah, so yeah. something that is hierarchical, something that you know can essentially limit. Because um, the bandwidth, you have it on, on the 5G, you have it on the cellular network, and that's you know how how far the technology is, is pushing there. Um, but what you don't want to necessarily want to have is, is a very uh, fat you know, data ingestion pipe that needs to reach all the, all the way into the cloud, particularly for this kind of application where you know, some, somewhat uh, things could be um, offloaded to, to a first stage, to an edge, and then aggregated, incorporated, perhaps even assisting from the privacy you know, point of view with the various uh, secure aggregation schemes that have been proposed, um, which have, you know, their additional operates and so on uh, for federated um, turning. Uh, so these are, you know, some thoughts on this, mm -hmm. not necessarily the only ones and not necessarily correct ones, but this comes to mind. Anna, any any thoughts on yeah. from the from the perspective of the cloud provider in terms of like the, the, the streaming data ingestion needs that they will have in order to aggregate this kind of knowledge and, and then broadcast the next the next uh, um, generation of uh, the, the next version of the model. So I guess the question is kind of about how, what's the traffic of that relative to traffic today uh, Correct. already, right? Correct. Um, well, not relative, but on top as well. Yeah, yeah, or what fraction it would be if you if you compose these things. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what you know utilization things are operating at right now, and what kind of extra capacity you would uh, you would need. I, I think it's a good question. I um, I'm not so sure. I mean, one thing uh, I was just thinking about earlier today, actually, when watching Mark your talk, I was wondering what fraction is the data input data of. Um, Related to the gradients, uh, right. and I guess that I mean that of course also depends on the model. But the input data and disaggregating and you know spreading out even just this data ingestion side uh, does put extra pressure on the network. And 
seems, I mean, in the Google analysis that we did, it was sort of the network can sustain it and it helps overall. But uh, yeah, if more and more things are being distributed, and, yeah, at some point, I mean, networks are, the bandwidth we get is continuing to scale and so on. But uh, yeah, I, I don't really know exactly how these things will play out. Of course. Uh, guys, do you have any other thoughts uh, on this on this topic? So um, um, I, I think I think an an interesting um, data point was when uh, COVID the pandemic started that everybody stayed home and we had uh, Zoom or Teams or all these uh, meetings uh, um, all day long. I think in the beginning there was a lot of uh, strain in this um, on the system and uh, it was kind of hard to have good quality, uh, but um overall it adjusted uh to, to be honest i'm not sure how compare how disproportionate is the data versus the model traffic for example uh, uh especially when you have all these um uh transformer models in these huge models coming and going and in terms of federated learning but i think overall uh uh, from the user side, or let's say uh, the science side, uh, they they treat in in, uh, in most of the cases uh, bandwidth as an uh, infinite resource. And unless your uh, application is very very specific, like you have some IoT uh, devices, or where the bandwidth by design uh, <coughs> is constrained, uh, meaning in the in your algorithm uh, these vanilla federated learning models are, or algorithms are treating that as infinite resource and you you see this gpt uh, model coming and going and things like that it's uh, it's super expensive but uh, overall i think uh, from the science side uh, people get more and more aware or uh, they they try to find the uh, good algorithms to compress either the gradients or to compress the models like uh, adapt for example federating adapters or lora matrices rather than the uh, transformer model. Uh, but I haven't seen anybody really care about the uh, ISP or uh, the bandwidth. Uh, <laughs> so the ISP is supposed to do their own thing and figure out the capacity as it goes, like uh, as they did in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, they figure out how to increase that. But um, yeah, I haven't seen any a, a, any research from the ISP st uh, standpoint. Maybe I'm completely in a different um, industry, so I don't know. But uh, uh, mm -hmm. from the science side, I think it's uh, mostly interesting how do you do uh, compression, like uh, sparsification of gradients or things like that. But it's not uh, driven by the ISP. I think it's just driven by other constraints you have. Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, so we talked a lot about training on device. Obviously, we see the proliferation of ML applications uh, mainly today on the deployment of ML and like uh, inference. And uh, devices nowadays are running uh, multiple uh, ML models, like either across applications or like at the, even at the middleware level, they might they might be uh, running stuff. Uh, so I guess that uh, going back to the dedication of uh, resources on device, that also plays an important role. Uh, Christo, uh, do you want to comment on this statement? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I guess when, when you train uh, on device, yeah, it's just that, 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 that specific model is training, other things sort of happen on device. Uh, so, you know, like maybe like if if you if you wanna go towards uh, like a, a federated learning solution or or something that sort of you know works well out of the box, uh, you have to consider how that interacts with you know anything else basically that happens uh, happens on device. Right, but uh, switching from the training uh, task to the inference task. Uh, nowadays we don't have one model being deployed on a device at one point, but you have like se yes. several models, uh, let's say, cohabitating uh, the device. And then at the same, at the same time, you have uh, potentially the, uh, the, the user themselves using the device. Uh, so how does this uh, play a role into like the, the design of algorithms and hardware uh, that is getting deployed on the device? 
yeah i mean i mean you, you obviously need to sort of have some way to uh you know to execute all of these multiple networks at once but i think like a, a good a good thing to keep in mind is that uh let's say if there's only a single entity that runs all of these all of these models there are sort of advancements so how you can do for example efficient multitask learning by sort of trying to share as much compute between all of the different networks that might be doing their own thing mm -hmm. um and that sort of then in turn sort of makes it more efficient and uh you know besides that yeah you also mentioned user interaction uh so that is that is also a very good point because i guess like depending on how uh for example uh things are scheduled on on the device right so you might want to have to do some uh, kind of training or inference or what is it like in the background but the user might be uh, playing a game on their mobile phone right so the like the priority of resources might not be the same uh and you know therefore you know one might uh might be lacking resources compared to the other uh so well, you know all of these considerations need to be to be taken into account uh, to sort of effectively realize such a goal do you think that the edge uh, the edge case should start taking lessons from the cloud side in terms of scheduling uh especially when you have a hierarchical setting where you where you have an edge device potentially uh getting requests from several leaf nodes uh in order to prioritize and uh, uh optimize the local resources and to 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 do as much to, to maximize throughput yeah i think so i think in, you know you might as well do i mean at some point there is going to be a bottleneck in, in terms of resources there um, yeah sure resource management does become important prioritization mm -hmm. understanding also you know to the extent possible what are the prior relative priorities and you know charge the accordingly and one more topic that i want to touch on is on the energy consumption and sustainability kind of thing uh, so we've seen like the impact that many large models like being foundational models being like large language models being diffusion models and so on and so forth have, like they require a significant amount of energy in order to be trained at the same time we have deplo alternative deployments such as federated learning that are being that are using commodity hardware essentially and this commodity hardware is not running is not getting power from a highly optimized uh, data center that resides i don't know in like uh, the northern part of sweden and uh, getting hydroelectric power, but it's like uh, out of, I don't know, uh, uh, like your regular plugs that uh, are on your house uh, that are burning uh, essentially coal or something. <laughs> so uh, any thoughts on like this, uh, this problem and how you see this playing at all into the next generation of uh, deployments? I mean, my, my voice would be that you know, the, the very least in the research community, there should be more attention to this topic. And uh, specifically, people should promote more of a resource to accuracy um, metric for mm -hmm. evaluation, in addition to time to accuracy, but you know, they shouldn't necessarily only be driven by the time to accuracy, particularly for federal learning, because in federal learning, as you're doing the training, you 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 anyway integrate into a model, but uh, the the time for serving that model is is, is very decoupled right, for training. So, time to accuracy, in my view, cannot be the sole metric, and nor the one that really you should strive to optimize for. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, if you don't have uh, anything else, uh, let's conclude then this. Uh, uh, panel, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, if uh, the 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 audience does not have any questions uh, with respect to the topics that we discussed, uh, I would like to conclude. Like, do you have any com like any thoughts on what you're looking forward to or what you're exciting excited about in terms of upcoming trends in the ML slash system world? I'd like to see transfer learning to become. Uh one of the major actually tricks um, and tools to, to rein in a lot of the topics that i mean discussed today and, and i've seen that in the space of federated learning there has been recently a very large uptick um, because uh, it has gone far beyond the original uses for you know teacher to student mm -hmm. uh, you know, with mutual co-distillation and whatnot 
there's a lot of potential for for um, actually not necessarily at the moment being more efficient, right? But actually really getting um, better performance, integrated performance um, in the context in which particularly you don't need to trade in one single model. You, know, you need to be conscious yeah. of also for you know how to state the problem statement correctly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and how to deliver generalization performance right? um, in a more democratized fashion. Great. Um, so that I look forward to. Anna? Yeah, I look forward to kind of uh, multiple di attacking the kind of efficiency question from multiple dimensions. So yeah, transfer learning I think can help also with uh, the efficiency aspect and maybe like not just model distillation but data distillations, so data efficiency. Uh, and yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities to really go at the boundary of systems in ML, um, which yeah, I'm personally also excited to delve deeper into that intersection. Great, um, Dimitri. So um, what I hear that I just uh, uh, second that is uh, less is more, <laughs> uh, if we can distill that uh, in one uh, in one line. But uh, I agree that uh, we uh, th this is something that makes me excited every day. How we can do more with less data, with smaller with smaller models, or let's say smaller gradients and things like that. Uh, I think uh, moving forward, this is um, a key. Uh, research question. Uh, uh, all, although you know, we uh, models right now are becoming more uh, larger. The device become more powerful. But I think this is not something uh, that is very interesting. Uh, uh, the hard question is how you can make uh, get the same performance with a smaller model, actually, uh, or with less data uh, in a smaller device. That's kind of what excites me lately. Great, thank you. And uh, Christo? Yeah, no, I mean, I second like all of the things I've heard, like uh, transfer learning is yeah, especially important. Even if you consider, for example, differential privacy and these kind of things, you know, transfer learning can be super beneficial because you just train on public data set and then you just fine tune privately and you don't really lose as much performance. Uh, yeah, efficiency, yeah, I mean, of course, you sort of train on the edge. You have to be as efficient as possible on training, communication, uh, and, and, and whatnot. So but I would also like to add sort of, you know, uh, perspectives more on the like data issues, right? So like unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning, in in fail rate learning, especially if you want to consider like practical deployments where, for example, you might not know the label, and and besides that, uh, sort of thinking about how to better like tackle distribution shifts that happen because federate learning is essentially about continuous learning uh, on the edge, uh, and how can we, for example. And have better out of distribution generalization or uh, you know better personalization performance uh, and these kind of things great thanks everybody for the discussion and the insights that they provided uh, thanks for participating even in different time zones and uh, yeah hopefully uh, we'll see all of this being integrated in the next session of distribute ml and uh, be discussing about like their their potential success or failure <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thank thank you for participating. And apologies for also the problems. All right, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Yes, exactly. <laughs>